Hello everybody, my name is Dratnus and welcome to my guide to Freehold Plus 21. You'll notice here that I'm starting out a little bit before we started the Keystone, that's because I want to show you this little death and decay trick we have here. So you'll notice right before we start the Keystone, our tank Snap is going to go over to where this mob will spawn in the Keystone, drop the death and decay, and then we start the Keystone. And what that's going to do is that's going to put those mobs in combat with us right at the start of this Keystone. You see they're actually walking towards us right now. And because of that, they're not even going to get infested. They're supposed to be normally an infested in that pack uh, with this infested pattern. But because of this strategy, it doesn't actually go off. So uh, that's how we do this pull here. We pull all three of these packs around here, and then we lust. The affixes active this week are fortified, uh, sanguine, necrotic, and of course infested. And you'll notice there we've actually had a couple deaths already. Three people have died so far. That's because uh, one of the dogs got loose and, and killed our healer, then our tank died, uh, and then one of our DPS got aggro and died. So this, this pull is already a little bit scuffed. People who... Uh, had Lust on them died, so we lost Lust on three of the members of our group, which is really big tragedy, and you'll notice that's doing bad things for our damage here. Um, but other than that, this, this pull normally goes pretty pretty well for us. That was just a little weird thing where the, the Mastiff there got threat or bit our healer and, and killed her, and that uh, was a big disaster for us on this first pull here. We probably lost about a minute or two to how much slower that made this first pull compared to how it normally is, because of course our Demon Hunter lost the meta that he had going into this uh, and everything, and it's a, it was a real tragedy all around. Nonetheless, Freehold has a very generous timer, particularly with some uh, clever uses of game mechanics that you're going to see later in this video. So we're able to recover, but uh, from here, it's, it, it, we're, we're really not happy about the way things have been going. You see, I had to health pot, health stone there uh, to not die to this. Of course, Snap has a, a tremendous amount of trouble here, both surviving and keeping threat on everything because he died on the opener of the first pull. Uh, and that means that, you know, he, he died with some cooldowns up, so he wasn't going to have those defensive cooldowns when he came in the second time. He didn't have all the initial threat he generated, and he's still in this precarious position where he's almost dying to Necrotic, and so he has to be both kiting and maintaining threat. And you see it's just it's going really bad for us. Some mobs are healing from Sanguine. Uh, this is not the, the start to the dungeon that we were really looking to look, looking forward to, and we were uh, pretty unhappy about things here. But again, you got to persevere. you, you got to continue through these things. Uh, and things with Prehold in particular, one wipe does not spell the end of a timer on pretty much any keystone level. Uh, it would have to be like a 22 in this week to have for that to have been true, but uh, on a 21 there's still plenty of time, easy, low keystone level, nothing to worry about. So uh, everything goes fine there, we, we rebuff, we re-scroll. Uh, I haven't re-ruined or re-fooded yet, as you can see by that little weak aura on the top of the screen, but I'll do so soon. And then we're going to shroud to the next part here, uh, which is going to be... we're going to pull four mobs. These four by the uh, by the ring here, and when we kill these, eventually that's going to spawn the first boss. Now th there are two actually there are two packs that can spawn Skycap and Crag. Uh, there's this one, and then there's one on the other side of the arena, down at the bottom of a, a set of stairs. And not very many people know about that, but the, the pack at the bottom of the stairs can also spawn the boss. So whichever one of those you kill, uh, you only need to kill one of those packs to kill the boss. And the thing is that every week one of those two packs is going to contain an infested mob. This week it's the one from the bottom of the stairs, so we were killing the one at the top of the stairs, but uh, in most of the weeks it's actually the one at the top of the stairs, the one that we're pulling right now that has the infested in it. So we usually actually end up pulling the one from the bottom of the stairs because uh, all other things being held equal, it's usually better to pull as few infested as you can over the course of a dungeon. Uh, you'll see now Snap is in kite mode. One problem with these Iron Tide Enforcers is that they're not actually slowable, uh, so they're just going to keep kiting Snap. One good thing they do is they actually throw him if they get close to him, uh, and that will they'll throw him at a ranged player, or at a player who has at range of them. And so if people are far enough away from him, you'll see there, there it actually threw him away, and that's helping him kite. It's facilitating his kite, is there, the abilities there. But then he got thrown back into melee because, of course, he was the, the, the enforcer that caught up to him was at range with us, who were in melee, so he threw him back to the main melee stack, and that, was, uh, that could have been disastrous if he hadn't already reset his necrotic stacks, which uh, he had, so that was good. And then we're just kiting around these things, uh, trying to not drop too much Sanguine in the middle of the boss room, but it's, it's not a huge deal if you do. Uh, the main place you really don't want to drop Sanguine when it's active is like right under where a boss will spawn, or in a place that you have to bring the boss, but if you drop it just somewhere in the boss room, uh, it's still better to drop it outside the boss room, but it's not worth worrying too much about. We just have to not use that part of the room, but you don't need too much of the room here, and I'm actually going to show you a really cool way that we, we handle Sky Captain Crag. Uh, so first off, he's in, the, he's in his bird form here, uh, and in the bird form, he randomly turns around and shoots players in the group, uh, and that's a dodgeable attack. So you'll actually see me popping an evasion here to just uh, roll the dice, uh, hope that I get targeted. And you see I actually did get targeted there. I got targeted again, dodged again. 
Uh, and that saves a bunch of damage on the group if you do get targeted while you're in evasion. So that's a, a useful thing to do and you don't have a better way to use evasion for the next two minutes anyway. So I recommend using it there. Uh, while the sky captain is in the bird form here. And then of course you gotta dodge the charge. Make sure that nobody's outside of the arena when he's charging or else he'll target them, charge them and reset. But there is actually a little bit of space outside the arena where the boss can go without resetting. And you'll see, uh, we've tested this pretty thoroughly and this is as far as we, we're comfortable taking the boss. We take him to this little spot here. Uh, and what that's gonna do is that almost all of the spits are gonna go on Waffle Sauce, our ranged player who's in the middle of the arena. And that means that we don't have to deal with spits in melee. We don't have to worry about repositioning in melee. And we don't have to worry about the one-two combo of a spit landing and then an Azerite shot killing us because those two abilities in conjunction can provide lethal damage without any, you know, uh, with no no recourse for the healer unless you pop a defensive quickly. Now there are still, you can see here, some of the spits that do go in melee. And uh, the way it works is that the boss or the shark bait spits on the closest player to him. Uh, so, but Sharkbait flies around in the center of the arena, but here we've gotten a little bit unlucky and Sharkbait has come towards the melee stack. Uh, that's, the strategy is designed to minimize that effect, but it still does happen sometimes. Uh, but Waffle Sauce is trying to bait as many as he can. The problem is Waffle Sauce can't get too close to us because Waffle Sauce needs to stay outside of the range of Azerite Powder, sh powder Shot. Because Azerite Powder Shot has a maximum range, and if you're farther away than that and you get targeted by it, it will still shoot in your direction, but it won't actually deal damage to you. And that's what we're trying to we're trying to have happen, is we're trying to have the shots that go on Waffle Sauce and Mischief, our two ranged players, not do any damage to anybody, and that makes the fight a lot easier to heal. Um, but we need to make sure that, of course, we don't take any damage from Vile Bombardment basically across the raid, because that'll be a huge problem. Waffle Sauce is actually outside of range of Mischief right now, so he's on his own. If he takes any damage from any source, he's not going to have anybody to heal it except himself, uh, or he'll have to come into range and come into danger to get heals. So uh, you'll see here the boss fight, though, proceeding pretty well. Now we're with the spits have finally left melee. That's good. The, the two spits of melee is actually more than we usually get with this strategy, so we're lucky that it, it ended up working out okay. Uh, and I did end up popping cheat death on this pull, which uh, was to a, a shot bombardment damage combo, as I was talking about, but it's lucky that it happened to me. And we did have a couple of shots this pull. The main goal with this pull is to never have shots hit two people at the same time. Uh, dying there is actually really good for me. That reset my cheat death and only cost us five seconds uh, and rebuffs on me, which is not a huge cost. But dying right at the end of a boss like that is actually a perfect way for me to get a new cheat death up, uh, which will give us more safety going forward. So now we're on to the next pull here. Uh, this Enforcer is a mandatory car a mandatory enemy to pull, basically. You, I mean, you could skip it theoretically, but it would require a lot more work than you're interested in committing for such a low gain. But what we are trying to do is we're trying to pull some mobs with this. Now, the Enforcer has more health and is more annoying than the mobs we're trying to pull, and the mobs we're trying to pull are our patrol. They're that patrol. So we had to wait for the patrol to get in good position. doesn't really matter, though, because, uh, again, the Enforcer has the most health out of any of these, so everything joining the, the fight while the Enforcer's half health actually works out pretty great in terms of uh, making the AoE damage efficient. Now we're just killing these mobs here. The Corsairs do this poisoning strike, which is a cast, and then they leap on the tank, and they put a poison on them. Uh, those will usually be synchronized between the two Corsairs, which is often good. You often want those to be synchronized, but uh, if they're somehow dealing too much damage, you could desynchronize them by, stru by stunning one of them uh, in the cast, and then they'll recast afterwards, but the other one will have already cast. Uh, usually it's nice, though, to have them be synchronized, because then you can just cleanse the poison uh, both sacks when they're applied at the same time there. The Bone Saws, which is one of the other mobs that we just killed there, or no, we've just killed right there, uh, is a mob that casts Healing Bomb, which is a, an interruptible cast that heals them, so you, you do need to kick that. And then of course the Enforcers just do the, the throw and the backhand, two abilities, which uh, I don't really have to worry about too much, you just gotta dodge the backhand and the throw is something that the tank has to deal with. Now we're into the other side here, the active weekly event this week is the Blacktooth weekly event, which means that we have to kill uh, those like six Blacktooth RP mobs, but we don't we don't actually want to do that yet. Our goal is that we want to join the Blacktooth crew as late into this dungeon as possible, and that's because when you join the Blacktooth crew, you remove all of the Blacktooth mobs from the rest of the dungeon, and we don't want to do that. We want to kill them. We want to get the mob count from them because we think they're easier than most of the trash in this place, and we'd rather have the pulls be six mobs per instead of having to figure out whether we wanted to do four uh, individually, which would be slower, or do we combine two four pulls, which would be eight, which might overwhelm us. Um, so that's that's the, the rationale behind not joining the crew immediately. It does mean that we're not going to be able to kill the Council of Captains until later in this dungeon, uh, which does mean that we won't have an updated graveyard in case there are deaths, but that's the, that's the price we're willing to pay to have a more efficient route that kills the trash that we think is easier and keeps the packs at a size that we prefer. We're starting off by killing this trapper. We just killed him in this little area back here. 
uh, you'll see there's actually a world marker, a green triangle world marker. That is a danger zone. If you are near there, you can actually fall off the side of the bridge there. And that's really, really disastrous. So don't let that happen. That's why we have it marked is because we, we that, that's the, the stay away from me triangle that we have on the ground there. Uh, we had a CC'd rat that was infested. We're just going to kill it off now, kill the Gahunis, and then we'll move on to the next order of business, uh, which is going to be pulling some of the trash around the Council of Captains room. When you're doing this, you have to be really, really careful to not accidentally target one of the ca captains and pull them, because if you pull them while all three are around, uh, you're probably going to die before you even get the chance to reset them, which is very, very bad. If you do have that happen, you should try to reset them uh, just by running away from the arena and hoping, hoping they do reset. Now, this is a pull where we've got uh, the Bill Drap Brine Scales, which need to be kicked, particularly on Frost Blast, but kick as many Water Bolts as you can as well. Uh, the Swabby, which just gives us the, the Don't Jump thing, as you can see there. Uh, I've got a, a little weak aura that reminds me not to jump and uh, calls me a mean, a mean name, a dumb dummy. Uh, so that's important. If you do jump, you just get stunned. That's really bad, though. It does happen to us surprisingly often, actually, for how high our Raider IO scores are. Uh, the Buccaneers do a, a Whirlwind effect. It's going bananas. You can see it right there. The annoying thing about going bananas is that it will recast if you stun it on the build-up to the cast. So you have to actually let one tick go off before you stun it, uh, and then it won't recast after that. So that's how that works. The knife jugglers are the easiest mobs in the place. Uh, they're also worth less count than the rest, though. They're only worth three, three points of count each instead of four points of count. Uh, and they just do a ricocheting throw, which, to the best of our knowledge, doesn't do any damage. Or if it does, it does close to zero damage, because even on a 21, you basically don't feel it. Um, and yeah, that, that's all the stuff there is in, in this little area here. We're dropping some Sanguine in the boss area, but it's fine because we're not going to be killing this boss for a while, and the Sanguine disappears after like a minute. Uh, these neutral mobs, the in interesting thing here is that the Kahunis will not try to infest these neutral mobs, so you actually have a long time because they're going to fixate on the nearest red mobs, not the nearest neutral mobs. Uh, so you have a bunch of time to kill off those those Kahunis there. It's weird, it doesn't behave like that in every dungeon though, like the droplets in Shrine of the Storm do get infested and Kahunis do go for them, so that's not a hard and fast rule, but it is how it works in Freehold. So now we're going to do a Bloodlust pull. We're going to pull two packs of five each. Uh, and we're going to lust. And this pack is, a, the, there's a little bit of, of deadliness going on here. Uh, this is the first time we're going to introduce the Cutwater Harpooner. The Cutwater Harpooner is, in my opinion, the worst piece of trash that we pull in this place. Uh, it does a harpoon. You can see there, Mischief just got harpooned by two of them, and she's almost dead. Uh, if there are ever three or more harpooners out, they can just actually one-shot people uh, if they all target the same person at the same time. But the big, big, big problem is that uh, there are a lot of abilities like going bananas and like the the big the big giant things when they do the ground pound or the boulder throw. And if you get harpooned at an inopportune time and you get harpooned into one of those abilities, uh, or if one of the mobs that's fixated on you is near and then you get harpooned, the blind rage there that you see from the, the scrappers, uh, which is a fixate where they just run at you and, and try to hit you if they, if they get close, then that's going to be lethal. That's going to be deadly. So harpooners are the, the mobs that in combination with anything else are the most likely way to kill you. So that's why we're A, only pulling two of them. We only ever pull two of them at once. And B, that's why we're lusting when we're pulling 10, 10 mobs with two harpooners. Uh, the kill priority was the brine scales first because they're casters, they're kicks, and we want to we get those out of the way. Uh, and then we're just killing everything else pretty evenly. The knuckle dusters also do a cast, but it is less important than the brine scale casts. And the Knuckle Duster cast is a, it'll interrupt you if it goes off, but it's not a huge deal, but it's still good to kick. But uh, it's also not a huge deal, but it is still good to kick. That's my my expert analysis on that ability. All right, so we're moving on now. We're heading over to the Ring of Booty, and our strategy here is actually we're going to Shroud and just and just do the boss fight now. Now, we've used a great game mechanic very, very cleverly here, and here's how this one works. If you kill Ludwig in base Mythic, so Mythic Zero, before you start the Keystone, uh, then in the Mythic Plus dungeon, Trothak the Shark Puncher, the last boss of the Ring of Booty, will be hostile instead of neutral behind the hut. Uh, and you can just pull him and not have to, you don't have to kill Ludwig or do the pig uh, in the Keystone. And that saves a ton of time. It's really an obnoxious thing because you do have to, like, you have to stealth to the, the ring. I have to stealth to the ring and I have to solo it most of the time because my group is always AFK. Uh, and do, I have to solo Ludwig on Mythic Zero. That's a huge, huge annoyance. Uh, and it's also really annoying because it, it just feels, it feels stupid, but. Uh, it's been around, that, that bug has been around for more than a month now. They haven't fixed it. Uh, everybody is doing it now that's done a high key, basically, of, of uh, Freehold. All the 20 plus runs, I think, are using it. Uh, or if not all, almost all. So we are using it here as well. Uh, but I do wish, I wish they'd get rid of it, or I wish they'd say, hey, don't use it. And then, you know, people would maybe stop using it if they, if they were, uh, you know, if they told us that if we used it, we'd get banned. But 
Uh, to the best of our knowledge, that's not the case because it hasn't happened yet and everybody is using it and everybody has been using it for the past month. So we're starting off by pulling some trash around here. You might be worried about putting blood in the arena, but we're actually, we're gonna wait, we're, we're gonna pull some other trash after we do this to let the blood despawn in this arena and the arena is actually the best place to kite all this stuff. Uh, there's not too many deadly mobs in here. There's just one knuckle duster, one buccaneer, uh, and there was the one brine scale at the start, which snapped death gripped in to be begin the thing. So it was very easy to keep it kicked. Other than that, the scrappers are a pretty low priority. They're just the ones that do the blind rage fixate. If you stun them either at any point in their channel or like when the channel is building up or when it's going down, they won't recast. And also it can be soothed by the druid uh, to prevent it from happening. So here we don't want to pull the crusher. We just want to pull all these neutral mobs. Uh, the deckhands have very little health. The shipmates have a medium amount of health. So all the deckhands are going to die off here and then the shipmates will be left. Uh, deckhands give one count each and shipmates give two count each, which means that we actually get a reasonable amount of count from this. Uh, you see you need 261 total count for this dungeon, and this pull gives us, you know, a solid 10 or something. Solid uh, solid 13, maybe. And that's pretty good for how easy it is. It's very, very trivial, and it gives us a, a chance to get that blood timer despawn ticking in the arena. And soon you'll see all this blood in the arena will start to go away, but we're going to start the boss fight uh, in the immediate future here, Just making sure I have all my stuff together. And I'm going to trick uh, Snap, and I was, I was going to pull the boss because Snap might not have had his Lightfoot potion up, but... He did have his Lightfoot Potion. You need to pull the boss and then get back into the arena fast so you don't get the, the rotten food thrown at you, which is what happens if you're outside the arena. Uh, but luckily, Snap had his potion available, so he was able to do that. Uh, now we're going to fight the Shark Puncher boss. This one, even on Fortified, is a, a bit annoying. Uh, it's not like a particularly hard boss in theory, but in practice, the sharks are uh, very deadly and they're likely to kill people. So the way it works is that when you pull the boss, the first thing he's going to do is throw the first shark, right? This long-nosed shark here that you can see that's active. Then he'll go into a shark tornado. Then he goes and picks up the long shark. Then he's going to throw a short-nosed shark. And that sometimes happens in the reverse order. Then pretty quickly, he picks up the short-nosed shark and throws another long-nosed shark. And this shark is going to persist through until the next tornado. And then that cycle continues. So he'll go tornado, pick up the long shark, throw a short shark, quickly pick up the short shark, and throw a new long shark. Yeah, the, the new long shark's out, and then he just does another tornado, right? Uh, so the way that you can always remember it in this fight is that the, the long-nosed shark is out for a long time, and the short-nosed shark, the hammerhead, is out for a short time. Uh, and you basically don't want to use any of the blood pools on the short-nosed shark, on the hammerhead, because that one's only going to be out for a short period of time. You can usually just kite it uh, for the five seconds while it's active, and you do want to get the slow debuff, the stacking slow from running through the blood, onto the long-nosed shark as much as possible. Uh, so that's that's our strategy here. You'll see while the shark tornado is going, sometimes I go and try and pick up the aggro on the the shark that's active to let our ranged, who's normally kiting it, waffle, uh, stand and cast for a while because I'm not going to be doing anything useful during shark tornado anyways. That's a nice little thing you can do if you're a melee and you want to make your range life easier. The way that the sharks work is that every you know every second or so, they will just jump towards the nearest person and then do an AOE on the ground around them. Uh, so you have to be the nearest person to them when they de are deciding where to jump if you want them to jump towards you. So if you're trying to kite them and you run too fast, too far away from them, then somebody else might be closer than you and they will fixate onto them instead uh, temporarily. You can always pull it back by running closer to it again, but that's how I see often people lose the shark is by uh, running away from it. Like they, they pick it up and then they run away too far, too fast. You'll see their waffle sauce kind of caught himself in a bad spot here, and you can actually see an interesting bug, which is that when a shark does kill somebody, it, it stops doing anything uh, until it gets picked up and thrown again. So that's at least a, a little a small mercy, is that if somebody dies, you don't have to worry about the shark for a little while. Uh, but that is, that is pretty common that, you know, you get caught out of position, uh, there's no blood near you, you don't have a movement speed increase, you're going to die to the shark. And that, that is what happened to Waffle there. Uh, ways to prevent that, save your movement effects for if you need them. Don't just, don't use them unless you absolutely have to, because you might get put in a spot where you really need them. Uh, so if you use them just kind of haphazardly, you're going to end up getting caught out potentially. Uh, and the other way is just always have a plan for what what, what's going to happen if a shark gets thrown on me right now. If you're at range from the boss, you, can, you should always be thinking about, all right, if, if I see a shark coming my way, where am I going to move so that I can quickly get it into the blood, which is what I need to do in order to have it, you know, not do anything brutal to me. All right, so now we're going to pull this crusher here. You'll notice that that dot actually ticked on me, the dot from the boss fight, and pulled me out of stealth, and I didn't notice, so I don't have a stealth opener here. That's bad news, bears. That's uh, that's not the strat. You just try and try and get your re-stealths if you can. Uh, we just want to kill this crusher. It's kind of annoying that we're killing it solo. It's, it's inefficient. It's slow. Uh, but due to the patrol positioning, we didn't want to run through. There's a little patrol that runs up and down outside the ring of booty, and so we didn't want to... 
We didn't want to go right then. I think this is pretty bad though. I probably lost a minute to doing this crusher by itself. Um, but that's what we're doing, so that's how it works. The crushers have two abilities. One of them is a boulder throw. You can see it right there. The boulder throw has a travel time, so the closer you are to the crusher, the less time you're gonna have to react to the boulder throw. Although even if you're right under the boss, you'll still have time to move because it does have a cast time. Uh, and then ground shatter is an AOE. The ground shatter AOE is larger than it looks. It's an AOE around the crusher and it's gonna do a lot of damage. It'll probably kill you if it, if it catches you in there on a high key. Uh, so you need to get away from it. And it does, the, the animation is a little bit smaller than how wide it actually is. So give it more space than you think you need to. All right, so now we're running back. I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna rub my nose a little bit there. Uh, now we're gonna run back and we're gonna do some more stuff in the uh, first boss or the second boss area. Our goal here now is that we're gonna kill the second boss and we're gonna we're gonna join up with, with the crew here, uh, with the Blacktooth gang. Uh, so Snap is gonna pull the RP mobs here. When you when you get in combat with either of those two knuckle dusters that's in RP combat with a training dummy, uh, all these other Blacktooth mobs will run there, but then they will run to you and they won't aggro other things along the way. So you just have to tag one of these things and you don't have to worry about clearing extra stuff in, the, in that area up there. Uh, all the other mobs are just gonna come to you and that's nice. Uh, this pack consists of two knuckle dusters, two brutes, and two scrappers. They do all give percent, so that's when this weekly event is active, you should make sure that you're incorporating the percent you get from them into your route. Uh, again, you just kick the knuckle dusters on their cast. It's a low priority kick, but it's the only kick that's around right now, so it's worth getting. Uh, if there were brine scales obviously involved, we'd be kicking them as a priority over the knuckle dusters. Uh, then the brutes do this really annoying like ground pound thing that slows you down and does AOE damage around them, so uh, that's kind of unavoidable as melee, we think. We think it's, it's worth it to just take it, but it does a little bit of damage, and it, it's uh, kind of brutal. And then the Scrappers are the ones that do the Blind Rage. It turns out that the RP version of the Scrapper, so the, these these mobs, the ones that, I'm calling them RP mobs, but the ones that you pull to, to join the crew, uh, behave a little bit differently than the ones that are just present throughout the instance. These ones are not soothable, it seems. So uh, our Druid has tried to soothe these ones a number of times, and they haven't actually lost the, the Blind Rage, whereas the rest of the ones in the dungeon, that does work on. Uh, and even though these are RP mobs, five of the six of them will still drop Sanguine when they die. One of the two Knuckle Dusters is actually doesn't die, he just becomes friendly afterwards. So that one doesn't drop Sanguine, which is a little interesting. That's uh, how it works though. You see we're trying to drop Sanguine here outside of the boss room. The main thing to do with Sanguine in this, per when, in this particular configuration is not to drop it anywhere where Eudora can jump. There are four spots in the room she can jump for Grape Shot. And you really, really, really do not want there to be Sanguine there because if she's at half health and she jumps there and, and plants herself in there, it's going to be really, really bad for you. All right, so the boss fight opening here, you'll see I've just not applied a poison to either of these bosses, despite attacking both of them quite a bit. I'm really unlucky. See, I'm going over there to make sure I've got a poison on Jolly. Uh, again, as an assassination rogue, you really need to make sure that you have your poisons on all targets that you have a Garot or Rupture ticking on. Otherwise, you're going to lose a lot of energy. Uh, but that actually did kind of scuff my opener a little bit. You'll see my opener is not doing very well over there. Uh, and then I have... So so the, the way this fight works is that you door... First off, there are a bunch of different config configurations for this fight. I'm just going to explain what's going on here. Uh, you'll see there I just used Evasion on a Powder Shot from Eudora. Eudora, every couple seconds, will pick somebody to cast a Powder Shot on. Uh, it's dodgeable, though. So every time it goes on our Demon Hunter, if he has Blade Dance available, uh, he can dodge it. Uh, and you'll see there, you can also vanish while it's being casted on you. Uh, I was going to vanish for, for damage there anyway, so it's really lucky that it targeted me. Uh, and then it just won't, you know, th that, that also negates the effect. She'll just stop casting it if you're vanished while doing it. You'll also notice that our priest, you know, th those penances are coming out from under this house in a weird way. What happens is she can actually line of sight. It's going to happen right there. Line, if, if she moves behind the pillar once she's targeted by Powder Shot, the shot doesn't actually go on her at all. It, it also negates the effect completely, which is really important because she's a cloth armor user and they take a ton of damage from it because it's physical damage. Uh, so that's why our ranged players are line of sighting as much as they can, uh, the Eudora effect. I was ready here now that I am out of evasion and vanish. I'm, I'm, I'm looking, you see, my, I'm mousing over her because my plan is if I get targeted, I'm going to try and be really, really cool and shadow step out of line of sight. But unfortunately, I didn't get targeted again, so I didn't get to the chance to try and look really, really cool. Uh, and Shadow Step and, and Line of Sight. Uh, and then Eudora also does the Grape Shot thing. Grape Shot thing, just, uh, she jumps to a corner and starts shooting across the room. See, so we've actually had a, a, a couple of deaths here. I'm not quite sure what happened. I guess Snap died to just necrotic high damage, maybe a little bit of Grape Shot in there. Uh, and then Zack died due to having Threat. Uh, and now we used our Battle Reses, so we're fine. Battle Reses are luckily something that you don't need very much of in Freehold, ideally, and we were able to save two for this fight. Uh, but that could have been that could have been really bad had we not had them. 
Uh, so then Jolly does two abilities. He does a, a surge, which is the blue swirly, and he, he charges there. Uh, and then he does he throws his blade, which is that red swirly. The blade then slowly comes back towards him, and if, theoretically, if it gets to him, he'll pick it up. But in practice, you'll see there it just spin, stays spinning on him for a really long time. Uh, and if it touches the tank, which it can very easily do if, you, if you're not careful, uh, it'll knock the tank way, way far. The, the knockback actually scales with M plus level. So on a 20, it's just, you know, zillions of miles. Uh, and reset the boss, basically, when that happens. So that's a huge disaster if that happens. Uh, and then also because the Raul is friendly this week, we're getting these these barrels, and if you stand in there, you get a 15% damage buff, which is nice. Uh, you can actually keep Raul in combat. If you stayed in combat out of the, after this, uh, you would be able to keep Raul and those barrels with you for the rest of the dungeon, but we prefer getting Miri stealths and getting Mischief the opportunity to, to regenerate her mana, getting everybody the opportunity to get out of combat and pre-pot again. Uh, it's possible, though, that the best strategy actually is to keep those captains in combat, particularly on some other weeks when the captain that is friendly is even more helpful than a 15% damage buff. Uh, so now we're pulling some more trash here. This is actually not the way we ended up doing this week. Uh, we ended up not even bothering with the infested pull that you see there's a sapped infested mob right now. We ended up not even pulling that uh, in future. We found a route that didn't involve it at all, but the way this works right now is that You'll see we there are only six mobs here, despite us pulling from two packs. That's because we've turned the all the Blacktooth gang friendly, so we don't have to deal with those. And now we're pulling two packs at once instead of one. That's our, our way to adjust to how it's changed. How it's changed. Uh, and what we did there is there was actually an infested Blacktooth mob, so we joined the crew, and then the infested mob became friendly, so we don't have to deal with it. Uh, and now we are only having to deal with one infested in this pull. Um, and we're just looking to get to enough percent so that we can cross over and do Harlan Sweets area. You'll see, still got eight minutes and 50 seconds on the clock, which is long enough to finish this place. Although again, uh, we've lost a, a bit of time here. You'll see I'm blinding the infested as it's running in just to make sure that it doesn't get any uh, any infested healing on low health mobs. That would be a tragedy were it to happen. Uh, and the Buccaneer, not a huge problem. You'll see Snap is starting to kind of make his way towards the bridge, starting to kite this uh, this Buccaneer in that direction because that's where we're gonna go next. And that's one one good tip is that Anytime you're fighting something that's easy, you should be thinking about how you're going to set yourself up for the next thing. That's, and that's true even if you're fighting something that's hard, but especially if you're fighting something that's easy and you don't have to use your brain power on surviving the pull, uh, you should be thinking about what you can be doing to make the next pull better, uh, how you can be pre-positioning yourself to make that better. Gahuni is kind of annoying that they spawned on that side of the Sanguine uh, because we have to cross the Sanguine, obviously, to kill them. Although I guess if they'd spawned on the far side of the Sanguine, they would have ran back across it and that would have maybe been even worse. So maybe we got lucky there uh, now that I think about it. Uh, now we're crossing the bridge here. The Ravagers cast Painful Motivation, which is the main reason that we pull these things here is because that is so helpful for us. Uh, and the way it works is that Painful Motivation affects both the Ravager and the two nearest enemies to them. And it gives them this buff that increases their damage done. But it also deals a load of damage to them. You'll see their health bars are just melting. That's not from us. That's just from Painful Motivation. Uh, so we're, just, we're pretty happy to let the Ravagers kill all their own friends here. That's the, that's the strat we have here. Uh, and then we're going to do the same thing for this next pack. On this infested pattern that was active this week, uh, there's actually an infested critter over there as well, so we've got to be really careful to not pull that, or else we're going to have to deal with two Gahunis out of it. That's the most troll thing that I think is in this game, is the fact that there's an infested critter uh, on some weeks. So my goal is to make sure that I don't kick Painful Motivation on the Ravager. You'll see I was very careful to not garrote it uh, out of my stealth, because that would have silenced it and prevented the Painful Motivation for a while. Uh, and then you'll see that three total mobs died very quickly. It was actually the three non-infested mobs, so you can see the painful motivation dramatically beats infested in terms of it outdamages the heal that infested gives to all those nearby enemies, and that's just further illustration of how how strong uh, using the painful motivation that way is. There's that, it's possible that we could have actually gotten all six of the mobs that we just killed to be motivated painfully, but this is the safest way that we found uh, to make sure that nothing is really super scuffable here. And the, the nice thing about doing it this way is that we reduce the chances of we don't, we're not fighting anything anywhere near that infested critter that you can see up there. Uh, and that is going to reduce the chances of, of something bad happening with that. Uh, so now we've got, our, we've got our full enemy forces count. We've got 6 minutes 20 seconds on the clock. That's all we need. Uh, that's much more than we need, actually, to kill Harlan Suite on Fortified. Uh, and we're going to stealth through to the boss now. Now, because we haven't pulled the boss or the, the trash that's in his boss area, it's going to take us a little bit. It's going to be a harder fight than if we had cleared all that stuff, but that trash is just so brutal this week. There's an infested enforcer, which can't be CC'd. Uh, so basically nobody, I think, was pulling that pack this week unless they were, they had like a, what you can do is if you have a mage, you can actually pull the Ravagers and then they get their painful motivation off and then you polymorph them and they won't die to their own painful motivation under those circumstances. Uh, so if you have that available, that's a useful way 
to keep a Ravager around and you can just use it to kill all the trash in this area. Uh, and if you do that, you might have been able to pull that trash uh, with this infested pattern, but we certainly were not interested. Uh, so now we're just going to pull the boss and we're going to kill it in this very short area of the room. In phase one, so until he, until he casts his 60% loaded dice, uh, whatever it's called, where he, he phases into the next phase, uh, only one target is going to be affected by Cannon Barrage, so we're, we're pretty happy to just have the range to be spread away from the boss. If they get Cannon Barrage, they just kite it around, uh, and everybody else stays close to the boss. Swift and Saber is dodgeable. It's, it's possible to see where it's going, but it's pretty hard, actually. Uh, all of us just get hit by it all the time. Luckily, it doesn't do very much damage. The main thing to do is make sure that you don't get knocked back into a bunch of Cannon Barrage pools. Uh, and then when you do get Cannon Barrage on you, you can see that the way Zach's doing it there is you actually you want to stand still for a bit. You can stand still for two or even three if you're you know if you if you're gonna be fast after the third one drops. Uh, but after the third circle spawns below you, then it's time to get out of there uh, because they will all land there. But you can you can stand still for one two three and then move once and then stand still until the the debuff is over and then move again. And instead of there being five full circles worth of area taken up on the ground, there will only be two full circles worth. That's a good way to to get more space than you have uh, or more more space than you should, uh, which is important because we don't have very much space. So now we're in phase two, everybody's being targeted by Cannon Barrage. And you'll see we're moving as a group, we're using the strategy, we're moving slowly, and that means we're gonna have enough space to use this small slice of the room without pulling that trash that we, obviously we can't pull those, that would be a wipe uh, at this point. So we're playing in a small amount of space, we've gotta maximize our, our space, and we're just gonna keep doing this little triangle rotation here uh, between three different points, this point that we were just at, the point here by the gold, uh, and then the corner that is just cleared up. And the Cannon Barrage clears pretty quickly, so you, you don't have to worry too much. Uh, it'll clear up by the time that the... It clears up so that you can keep this three-point movement very easily. Uh, cannon, or the, the Swift Wind Sabers go in all directions now. It's basically impossible to dodge them. You get a bit of a grace period after you get hit by Swift Wind Saber, where you're not damageable by them. So uh, usually everybody just ends up taking one total hit of Swift Wind Saber. I'm trying to dodge here, but it's, it's futile. It's, uh, it's impossible. There's no way anybody could do it. You'd have to be a genius. Uh, and now he's entering his last phase. When he gets to 30%, he's going to get an attack speed increase, but he's also going to get a damage taken increase, and 100% damage taken increase. And that's going to make him very, very... He's going to die extremely quickly from this point. He effectively is only at 15% health uh, once, once he hits 30% health, and he's just going to fall over. Some people hold cooldowns for there. Uh, I, I would have loved to have my cooldowns available to help Pat on this, and I, in fact, it looks like my cooldowns are actually going to come up, which is wonderful news, my Vendetta and my Vanish, uh, because that's going to that's gonna help me do some more damage at the end here, but uh, it's usually not actually worth holding your cooldowns for this phase, because he's going to die. It, it, it's, better, you're, it's more efficient to just use them whenever they're available. Uh, it's not one of the phases with a, like a true execute, because it's just based on his percent health. Anyways, I'm, I'm rambling on now about, uh, about stupid theory. But that's how we beat level 21 Freehold. Got a nice little 370 leech ring there as a reward for my efforts. I hope you guys have enjoyed this video. Uh, if you have, remember to like and subscribe my channel. That'd be cool. Uh, I've also got other content on this channel. I've got other dungeon guides for other dungeons. Uh, and I have affix guides and I have rogue guides. You can check those out. I also make weekly MDT routes that you can grab. I have a Reddit post and soon I will have even more places where you can get those from. But that's to be announced in the future. Anyway, uh, I hope you've enjoyed this video and I will see you in the next one.